So uh, I want I don't want to be formal, buddy, but I'm going to say so, Dr. Kanye. Dr. Kanye's, Professor Kanye's, look, I have this burning question. We're on a Sunday right now. It's a Sunday. And, uh, you know, we're in July. Now, things have changed since the time now. You, well, I'm addressing you as a biblical scholar or somebody that knows about religion more than a whole bunch of other people. And it seems to me back when, isn't July and August some sort of additional months and blah, blah? And what's the, well, I'm trying to figure out what's the Sabbath and all the rest of that stuff. What is all this? Well, tell me about the Sabbath and what's, what's the day for blah, blah? I don't know. Well, uh, some of these questions are extraordinarily difficult to, uh, to explain because uh, scholars are still in debate about some of these different things. Um, if we go back to the Conference of Nicaea in uh, 325, many of these issues were debated and discussed at the uh, Conference of Nice Nicaea. Among those issues was whether or not, uh, one of the pressing issues of the Conference of Nicaea was whether or not Jesus was both God and man at the same time, what day was the Sabbath, and a whole host of other issues that the two opposing sides of the bishops uh, organized by Constantine uh, were there to settle. And uh, uh, let me just say that Constantine pulling together the Conference of Nicaea was not a religious uh, issue for him, it was a political issue for him. It was him trying to settle religious conflicts within the empire. He didn't care what came out of the conference, what he was most concerned about was unity in the empire. And so many of these issues, up until the point of the Nicaea Conference, there really was no consensus as to which day was the Sabbath. Uh, it could have been any day of the week because it's not specified in the Bible what day the Sabbath is. And so these were the political decisions that came out of the Conference of Nicaea. And even to this very day, there are some scholars who still debate and dispute some of the issues that come out of the Conference of Nicaea. And in fact, if one takes a look at the Nicaean Creed... Hold on, then, I'll stop you for a second. Yeah. You just said, in the Bible. Now, I'm trying to figure out, didn't they have the Bible and the Talmud or something like that and some other stuff happened? So what, what, I'm just, just well, uh, a little point. Uh, again, uh, when we talk about the Bible, what we are now talking about the canon, we're talking about what is called both the Old Testament and the New Testament, both of which are Christian terminologies. There really is no such thing as an Old Testament and New Testament. This comes about as a, as a result of the rise of Christianity. Um, <coughs> the Old Testament, uh, often known by other people as the Tanakh, includes what we call the five books of Moses. Uh, uh, or the, uh, 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 the five books of Moses, and which is, which is normally considered to be the Old, Old Testament. The books put together as a canon is what people are now calling the Bible. The word Bible just simply means nothing more than book. And it's more or less a collection of scriptures rather than something that was written by an individual from the beginning to the end. Uh, the Talmud, uh, many people talk about the Babylonian Talmud, that also has uh, some reference to what happened during the Babylonian captivity where much of some of the major writings that went into the religion came after the Babylonian captivity, which was about 586, somewhere in there. Uh, and when they came back, first and foremost, the Babylonian captivity, everybody was not taken away to Babylon. Only those people, the king's court, the king, people that had uh, information or skills that was necessary for the people in Babylon. But a whole host of people stayed behind. And when some of those people came back, all of them did not come back. They brought back certain writings that they had done there. And in fact, one of the things that scholars often talk about was that while they were in Babylon, they picked up the entire Noah's Ark story and brought that back too. And that became a part of of the uh, what we now call the Old Testament. Okay, so so let's get back to uh, Constantine. So Constantine is, is getting uh, with the scholars, just religious people, just ordinary people, bringing them all together. Who was at this thing and how? No, he brought he brought together bishops. Uh, scholars, religious scholars from throughout the empire to settle the pressing questions of the empire. Okay, I'm sorry, how far reaching was this empire? Oh, it, far, it went as far as Egypt and up, you know, certain parts of North Africa. It was pretty widespread throughout uh, all of Europe and he brought uh, bishops from all over the place to, uh, to settle the pressing questions of the church. And let me just make one point. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm just someone who spent a lot of time studying uh, some of these issues that were helpful 
and me explaining these things to African people in class because African people are quite often embedded in these concepts and know very, very little about these concepts. I was once in a debate here in Harlem called The Great Debate in Harlem, Is the Bible Good for African People, put together by CMOTAP. And at that conference, at that lecture, I presented some of the things I'm talking about today. I'm sorry, when I say biblical scholar, I just meant that, that you also have access to biblical scholars and, you, and when you do your research, you actually talk to people and, and try to get information. Right. <laughs> or I listen to biblical scholars as well as doing my own, my own readings. Lately, one of the biblical scholars that I've been uh, most interested in and his writing has been Bart Ehrman. And he's written sorry, a, what's the name again? Bart Ehrman. Mm -hmm. He's written, now he's not the only one, but he's a number of people. But the first scholar that actually perked my interest in this was, I mean, to really get down and study this was Dr. Yosef ben Yekinen. Listening to Dr. Yosef ben Yekinen and Dr. John Henry Clark and others really perked my interest. But I must say that in actuality, I was born this way. For my earliest rec recognitions um, and recollections, uh, I recall even at the age of two or three questioning what I was being told by my grandparents and others in the family in terms of what they were putting forward as religious doctrine. And they were pretty religious and I was rebelling against all of that. It did not seem correct even to a child. It did not seem natural. It didn't seem logical to me as a child, although I had no way of, uh, as a child, explaining what I was feeling. They would just tell me to be quiet or not to, you know, question and things of that nature. But it didn't seem right. And so when Dr. Yosef Ben Yekinen came along and started explaining things and putting things into context, it perked my interest. And I then go began going out and picking up as many books as I could to read about as much as I could, along with reading the history of African people and studying this. And so I've come to certain conclusions. And I, I must say that where I stand at this particular point in time, uh, if I'm not agnostic, you might very well call me an atheist. I am not a believer in any of the major forms of religion. I'm more or less, I understand them, I respect them, but I am not a believer. And I prefer to think of myself as someone who looks and who seeks rational thought, reason, and evidence for whatever it is I'm going to believe in. Mm. Can I just interject my uh, belief, if you will? Sure. I, I heard about this thing called a deist. To me, it just basically means right. you, you study a bunch of stuff and you come to the conclusion, hey, they all, everything leads to God, so I just call myself a deist. And right. It doesn't matter to me, but I guess I'm at the same point you are, right. just that, just that, that, that people understand. But if I say agnostic, people have this whole thing. If they say right. atheists have this whole thing, but if I say deist, they got to look it up. You know what I mean? So right. I, that's the only right. reason why I do it. And it depends on what people mean by a deist and a theist. <laughs> yeah, Normally, what people mean by a theist is a theist is something someone who believes that God interacts with the world and that you could pray to a particular deity and that deity will respond in some shape, form, or fashion. A deist generally, in general parlance, a deist is someone who believes that there is some higher force, some higher power responsible for all things. However, it doesn't interact with the, with the natural world. And those are the basic differences between the two. However, different individuals even have nuances within those. And this comes to the question of what religion is and what spirituality is. That means different things to different people at different points in time. It is, a, it is really an extraordinarily difficult question, even for scholars, to come up with a definition of religion or spirituality that everyone would us accept, just like many other concepts. It means different things to different people at different points in time. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> looking at that, especially for African people, and I would dare say, uh, for someone like me, and I'm very, very reluctant, I'm doing this for you to talk about this, because if there's anything that can excommunicate you from the black community is having a discussion on religion. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't right. really mean to veer us. Can we just get back to this whole political right. situation with, with Constantine? Right. Because we'll, we, we, I just wanted to deal with this Sabbath thing and right. whatever, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the political situation with Constantine was, in a nutshell, was that he was concerned about the religious conflicts within the empire, and he wanted to settle that. He himself was not a Christian originally, although his mother was. He wasn't a Christian. And what he wanted to do was bring religious peace ecumenical peace, so to speak, within the empire. So he convened a council of high-ranking religious authorities. Among those was a bishop by the name of Arius and another bishop by the name of Athanasius. And they were on opposing sides of the issue. Some of the issues, once again, was whether or not Jesus was both God and man at the same time, whether or not Mary was a virgin. It was a whole bunch of issues that they were grappling with. And the outcome of this whole thing, to make a long story short, 
was won by the side uh, with Bishop Athanasius, and they laid the foundation. They were the winning side. They laid the foundation of what many Christians believe today. And that's why I was pointing out earlier, if one looks at the Nicene Creed, the very issues that they were debating inside of the conference are in the Nicene Creed. You know, there's only one God, and Jesus is, all of that is in the Nicene Creed. Those were the very issues they were debating. It is the result of what most people believe of the winning side on the debate of religion. The losing side, by and large, became heretical. They were viewed as heretics, by and large, by the winning side. And so what most Christians today, especially Catholics, today and other Christians believe today is by and large the result of those religious battles uh, that ensued at the Nicene Conference, of, uh, among which, <coughs> which, which they would be deemed the Sabbath. These were political decisions, not religious decisions. And this is why they had to debate it, because the scriptures that they were using at that particular point in time were not clear on these issues. So different bodies of scholars had different opinions as to the nature of Christ, the nature of God, whether you know, all of those different things were being debated. So it was a political question. Constantine was only concerned about bringing unity, religious unity and peace to the empire. He did not care, once again, what the outcome of that was. He didn't care what the truth of that was. What he cared was bringing solidarity to the empire. Mm -hmm. And there were tons of books on this. You know, uh, there's one book called, and I can't think of the author right now, called The Records of the Nicene Conference that everybody can read. But there are tons of works on that. Okay, well, look, uh, I, I, I want to stop here. I, I think we're going to have the ongoing thing, especially in this area. We have a lot of things to talk about because mm -hmm. you are, that, well, whatever. Uh, so let me let you enjoy your um, <coughs> Sunday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk again. Thank you so much. Thank you.